Hey everybody, welcome back to the lost episode. There were some lost episodes Ooh, of the two Steve. And they went me. away. This is, this is off the top of the show. I know that Everybody's you want tuning to out. sing with me because you and I are rad. The lost episodes doesn't mean that we've lost all of our listeners. That's not what we're trying to do with this thing. This is We lost Nigel, didn't we? I'm sure we lost him last week when you started singing like that. Now who's gone? <laughs> Take me back tonight. I'm a lost episode of the Dude and Steve Venshite. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Episode two of the Lost Episode Trilogy. Enjoy, folks. Thanks for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. What the hell is this little tea party? And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield. First of all, gay. And Big Anklevich. Second of all, stupid. Mm. Yes? Mm. Really, I hadn't thought of it that way. Mm. No, no, that's going a little far. I have to stop you there, sir. Uh. Welcome, everybody. Yes, to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. That's right. Episode 96. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Thanks nice for to, coming over. Nice Thanks for coming back. You gotta stop adjusting your chair and yourself. Adjust these. Nice to see y'all. Thanks for coming. Uh, Maybe we should move along to the story now. We have a story for you today, which is not usually the way we do it, but we're going to do it that way today. We have a story. And uh, it's a good one. Today's story is called what, Rish Outfield? It is called Sides by Clay Duggar. Clay Duggar. Does he pronounce it that way? I don't think they speak like that in Texas. Duggar. Duggar. My name's Clay Duggar. Oh, but similar mentality, I think, as uh, that of Crocodile Dundee down there. Tell us about Clay Duggar, if you would. Okay. Clay Duggar is a happily married 43-year-old San Antonio, Texas native. Although by now it's been so long, he may well be a 44-year-old. but uh, 45-year-old divorcee. <laughs> he and his wife have been married 15 years. They have no children, but they do have one cat. Warning. The C word. And somehow we managed to overlook this in accepting a story. Hmm. Shan't happen again. In his life, Clay has cleaned bathrooms, dug ditches, flipped burgers, and hired and fired people. Currently, he works in the billing office of Texas's largest group of anesthesiologists. His story, The Sunshine Walker, was selected honorable mention in the 2002 Writer's Journal Short Story Contest. He has three stories published on the Tales of the Zombie War website, where Doonstief alumnus Kevin David Anderson has also been seen. Shooting for the stars. Keep your feet on the ground. He is working on two vastly different sets of stories. There is a series of zombie stories, and there is a series which takes place in the fictional town of Bell, Texas. Also about zombies. <laughs> While he counts many authors as being inspirational, Clay credits Ray Bradbury as having the most influence on his writing. We'd like to thank Renee Chambliss for producing today's story. She produced this one, too? Yeah. How did you get her to do that? I just sent it to her and said, hey, you want to do this one next? And she didn't say no. So if you're quiet, that means you agree. And there's even a cameo appearance by our author, Clay Duggar, in this one as well. So watch out for that one. It's impressive. It's better than any Alfred Hitchcock. Well, no, it's not. Forget it. Sides by Clay Duggar. Now. Mr. Stanley, can you hear me? The woman's voice intrudes on my fog. I'm enjoying my fog. It's peaceful. It was quiet. Mr. Stanley. She stretches it out. Carl? Yeah, I hear you. Now go away. I go to turn over and find myself restrained. Ankles, 
wrists, chest, and head, all strapped down, tight. Hey, what the- Please be calm, Mr. Stanley. The restraints are for your safety, as well as ours. What? Safety? How is strapping me to a table making me safe? The voice, as I begin to think of it, says, Well, you wouldn't want to get shot now, would you? I had to agree. I've been shot. No end to the trouble it causes. Okay, well couldn't you just lock the door? Oh, we did that too. The voice sounds as if she is smiling. I lay still, as if I have any choice in the matter. I really want to move. Movement helps me relax. Funny as it sounds, I get jittery when I can't move, which, of course, makes me want to move even more. In the brief moment before she answers, I start trying to inventory myself. I don't feel clothing on my arms or feet, but it feels as if the rest of me is covered in a sheet. I assume this is a hospital gown. The crook of my right arm feels like it's bandaged, like I've had blood taken. As I cannot move my head, I cannot see anything but the ceiling. I see a small round grill mounted there. The voice seems to be coming from that grill. All right, she says. I will have someone release you. However, if you attempt to escape or injure anyone, you'll be shot immediately. Do you understand? Shot. Right. Got it. I roll my eyes. It's the only thing I can do besides make rude gestures with my hands. I do that, too. Several different ones. There is no comment, so I assume that I'm not on camera. Either that or they just don't care. After a full minute, I hear a bolt throw and a door open. A man dressed in military fatigues comes into my field of vision. He puts something hard against the top of my head. He says to me, Move. Please, I'm tired of fighting you people. Another military type comes into view and yanks on the straps around my right wrist, then leaves. The rude man holding that hard something to my head says, Count to sixty out loud, slowly. Then you can undo the rest of the straps. If you start before sixty, even on fifty-nine, I'll be back. He taps me hard on the head and adds, With my friend here. The hard thing, I'm assuming it's a gun, leaves my head. I hear the door close and the bolt throw. I start counting. I count to 65 just to be sure, adding a nice seven-letter expletive beginning with F in between the 60 and the 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. The voice comes back. Now, Mr. Stanley, there's no need for sarcasm. <laughs> I laugh as I undo the straps. Oh, no. No need for that at all. Finally standing, I see a room no more than ten feet on a side. Gray. One door. One gurney. I am dressed in a hospital gown as I suspected. I start to pace around the room. Ah, that feels much better. Can I have some clothes? I'm sorry, but that would put our people in unnecessary danger. Nobody is to be in your presence unless you are properly restrained. Ah. Uh, I nod my head. I see. So I'm just going to starve in here, then. Are you hungry? The voice asks slowly, almost with apprehension. Actually, yes. I'm sure you've done your research. I like red meat. Very rare. After all, that is why you grabbed me, isn't it? Because I'm a zombie. Then. I'm not really a zombie. I'm just, well, part zombie. No, I, I don't mean my mother was a zombie and my dad was a baker or anything. I'm just immune to whatever virus created the zombies. What really pisses me off is that it was a nine-year-old girl who bit me. Tried to eat my face. I should have shot the little twerp when I first saw her. I and some other people were trying to get to Goodfellow Air Force Base in San Angelo, the only federal safe refuge in our immediate area. The FSRs had been set up all over. The feds had selected some defensible locations and armed the snot out of them. Any live human, 
and the distinction was now very real, could come to any FSR. If there was room, they would be allowed inside. If the FSR was full, the best you could hope for was to stay close to the barrier. The troops did all they could to keep the zombies at bay, and you might get lucky. Of course, you could get shot or blown up, too. It was a chance you took gladly. We were 10 or 15 miles from the Goodfellow FSR, coming in from the east on some farm-to-market road. Look it up. It's the middle of freaking nowhere. We were cruising right along in a beat-up old Ford pickup. A couple with their son rode in the cab. I and two other guys rode in the back. We topped a rise, and there they were. A bunch of zombies. I don't know how many, but a lot. Just walking up the road, heading the way we had come. The guy driving did the only thing you can. He punched it. When he hit the group, bodies flew everywhere. He must have taken down half of them. Maybe even killed a few. But he also almost took us out, too. He lost control of the truck, and we went sliding sideways down the road. God, or luck, or, or something, kept the wheels on the asphalt, and we didn't get tossed out on our heads. The truck stopped when the two leading tires blew. It leaned up horribly, but settled back down. Steam billowed from under the hood. The radiator had been damaged. The truck wasn't going anywhere. The remaining zombies had already turned and started toward us. They were moaning and growling hungrily. We hadn't slid very far, so we had just enough time to jump down and start shooting. The couple in the cab joined us, locking their young son inside. Way to go, Bob, I told the driver. Good job. His response was rather blue, if you know what I mean. We were all armed, shotguns mainly, but I had a pistol, big old forty-five with six or seven clips. We chewed through the front zombies real quick, but the rest just kept coming. That little girl I mentioned came to the lead and started running right at me, growling. Shoot her! The guy next to me said. George, Jim, something like that. He turned his gun on her, but just like in the movies, the damn thing just went click. She's just a kid! I'm not shooting a kid! I yelled. By this time, the point was moot. She was on me, jumped right at my face. I threw my right arm up, and she chomped down. I screamed like, well, like a little girl, and put the pistol to her forehead. Then she was falling to the ground, that horrid, black, smelly crap they have for blood spraying all over me and George. Or Jim. Whichever, he got covered in it, too. That was it for me. I turned and exercised the better part of valor. I booked it. Didn't even bother to see what happened to the others. I knew that if they survived, I wouldn't. They'd take me out just like they did the zombies. And if they didn't survive, the zombies would just add me to the menu. I ran until I couldn't breathe. Wasn't far. I never was an athlete. Put me at a computer and I'm good. Running, not so much. When I had to slow to a walk, I was burning up. I figured it was that zombie virus, and that I was going to join the hordes of the walking dead. I had dropped the pistol in my flight, so I couldn't even do myself in. I eventually fell and couldn't rise. My arm was bleeding and hurt like hell. I was covered in stinky black zombie blood. I was so hot, so tired, I just laid down and went to sleep, cradling my arm. I woke up a few hours later, according to my watch. My arm wasn't bleeding or hurting anymore. I was hungry as all get out, but not burning up. And I wasn't a zombie either. I reckon that if I could tell I wasn't, I wasn't. So there I lay, in the middle of Texas, somewhere near San Angelo, alive, hungry, and twitching. That was new. Felt like I needed to get up and just move. So I did got up and started walking. The movement made me feel a lot better. There appeared to be a farm or something like that a couple miles off. I could just see the house. As I started that way, I heard footsteps behind me. Yep, you guessed it. I turned to find zombies. Five of them, walking right at me. Well, I turned tail and took off. For about two steps. My twitchy legs betrayed me and I went down. Did a face plant right into some dumb little bush. About the time I managed to frantically untangle myself, the zombies had walked right past me. Seriously, went by like I wasn't even there. Except the last one. He must have been around 40 when he turned. 
but was all gray like they get. A vacant stare. You've seen them. He stopped and looked down at me and spoke. Now, the voice replies, No, Mr. Stanley. We don't think you're a zombie. We're actually interested in why you aren't. Well, I'm immune, aren't I? And we want to find out why, she says. But from the bandage on my arm, I assume you've got enough blood to tell you plenty. You don't need me anymore, do you? Oh, we've studied your blood. I would like to discuss the results with you. After just this few minutes of pacing, I feel much better. I hop up on the gurney. So what, I'm a doctor now? I don't know anything about blood. We found some similarities between your blood and that of a zombie. We would like to know what behavior you have been exhibiting that could be considered, um, zombie-like. I smile. If only she knew. Sarcastically, I say, I prefer a zombie-ish. It's more friendly. The voice laughs. <laughs> okay, Mr. Stanley. Zombie-ish. And by similarities, I assume you mean those black streaks in my blood? And that god-awful stink? Yes, but we're having trouble isolating the immunity factor. If it's in your blood, we can't find it. We are having some problems with the met hemoglobin. It's interfering with our research. I make a face. What's it? I'm sorry, Mr. Stanley. Met hemoglobin is similar to hemoglobin, but is receptive to iron, not oxygen like hemoglobin. In normal humans, met hemoglobin is found only in very small amounts, while hemoglobin carries oxygen to all the body. In zombies, the two are reversed. They have almost no hemoglobin. Your blood, though, carries an equal amount of both. And it appears to be, um, magnetic. I'm sorry? I shake my head. D did you just say magnetic? Yes. It appears to be a side effect of the high amounts of bioelectricity present in the bodies of zombies, and somewhat present in your body. That is making it almost impossible to study your blood. I'm afraid that we are going to require, well, other samples from you. Well, this day just keeps getting better, doesn't it? Then... Zombies don't speak with their mouths. They think at each other. And let me tell you, they ain't great conversationalists. The man who spoke to me simply said, They're food? My ears heard a slight growl, but the words were in my brain. My jaw dropped. All I could do was shake my head. He must have retained enough brains to know what that meant. That, or the fact that my own brain had just gone completely blank, did the trick. Either way, it was enough. He turned and resumed following the others. Now, I'm not the most inquisitive guy, but you gotta admit, this was weird enough to check out. So, believe it or not, I followed along, too. At a distance. Zombies don't normally move as fast as regular folks, but they do get along. It didn't take us as long as you might think to get to the house. I stayed back quite a ways, figuring the zombies would be cut down if there was anybody home. I was right. The first zombie's head exploded, the bullet going right on through and into the chest of the second zombie in line. She flew back and didn't get up. Contrary to popular belief, you can take a zombie down without a headshot. It's just more difficult. Her spine must have been severed because she twitched for a couple seconds, then lay still. I heard her die. In my head, I heard her die. There wasn't any coherent thought, just a general feeling of... Well, the only way to describe it is a feeling of ending. I know that doesn't make much sense, but there it is. The other three looked down at her, then at each other. The same thought ran through all three not-quite-dead brains. I heard it plain as day, though not with my ears. Food. Seems they know that anyone who can shoot a gun can provide a little sustenance. They all three turned and started running toward the house. Even as far away as I was, I could hear the howls and growls they always make when close to meat. 
they didn't make it to the house. But it wasn't for lack of trying. The last one to fall was just a few yards from the front door. Oh yeah, that's something else. Zombies know about doors and windows. When's the last time you saw one not try a door or window? They do remember things, know things. Not much, and not on any kind of intellectual level, but they know. They know. I thought about approaching the house, but took off when they started taking shots at me. I guess traveling with zombies while being covered in black zombie blood isn't the best way to win friends and influence people. It took a while, but I finally found another house. I had managed to clean up somewhat. I convinced them I was all right, that the bite on my arm wasn't from a zombie, but from a pissed-off girlfriend. I guess the fact that I could actually tell them that worked in my favor. They gave me something to eat, but it almost made me sick. The vegetables smelled rancid to me, and the meat seemed burned to a crisp. I got it down to be polite, but only just. They put me up in the living room. Late that night, I snuck over to the kitchen and found some thawed hamburger meat. Raw. Man, was that good. I had gone from meat and potatoes to steak tartare. I knew the bite had done it, but didn't know why I hadn't changed completely. As I ate, I found myself pacing around their living room. It was late at night, or early morning, whichever you prefer. I hadn't slept since waking up in the grass, and I wasn't tired. Believe me, I should have been beat the day I had. I mean, gunning down zombies, running for my life while bleeding, then walking no telling how far. Not to mention the fact that zombies now talk to me. I should have been exhausted. Nope, just walking around somebody's living room. I walked and thought the rest of the night. I didn't remember ever seeing a zombie stop moving unless it was killed. And that meant they didn't sleep. The best I could figure was that I was almost a zombie. Great. Just what I needed. Now. Now, I say, regaining my feet. When you say other samples, I'm hoping you just mean more blood, right? The voice hesitates. Well, no. We are going to need several different samples. The easy ones are urine, semen, and stool. The others are a little more, um, invasive. Holding my hands up in front of me, I say, Hey, I'm all for scientific advance and defeating the zombie menace, but I got my limits. I'll pee in a cup for you, and you can go mining in the toilet as much as you want, but that's about it. I ain't looking for a good time, and, and I ain't really geared up for no surgeries. We will be as careful as we can. We have a fully functional surgery here, so you should suffer no adverse effects. We aren't taking any samples that aren't taken from normal people. Just cell samples from most of your organs, some muscle cells, and bone marrow. That's it. Oh, that's it. I am very agitated. Hmm. Huh. Wonder why. Well, not much, is it? Just samples of everything. You know, the freaking zombies don't treat people this way. The zombies never imprisoned me, never threatened me, at least not after that little girl bit me. Sometimes they are more humane than people. They don't treat their own like this. I don't say this out loud. She goes on as if I hadn't said anything. As you know, zombies don't decay while they, uh, live. Even though they are technically dead, their bodies don't ever break down, don't seem to age. Our tests indicates the same kind of activity. That's one of the things we want to investigate, and that requires tissue samples. First of all, stop trying to sell me on this. It ain't gonna happen. And second, are you saying that I'm not going to die unless somebody kills me? I can almost hear the voice shake her head. No, but you probably won't age at the same rate as normal people. You could be a walking fountain of youth, as well as the way to end this war. Hmm. Interesting. The voice comes from the grill again. You said you like rare meat. Did you before the bite? Hell no. I'm a... Well, I was a well-done kind of guy. Didn't want no E. coli, you know? Go figure. But no cravings for humans? The voice asks. I lie. No, I ain't no zombie. I haven't gone over to their side yet. The voice is anxious. Yet? 
Have you considered it? Are you saying you actually want to be a zombie? Once more, I stop my continuous trip around the room. I am not one of the walking dead. I'm still me. Not that you care. If you thought I was human, I wouldn't be here, would I? We've investigated you thoroughly, Mr. Stanley. We have talked to everyone involved in the shooting incident at Goodfellow. We know of your preference for rare meat, your constant need to be in motion. We even understand how all of that works. What we want to learn about is how the zombies seem to treat you like one of their own. If we could duplicate that, we could stop every future attack. It would give us an enormous advantage in our war against these unfortunate creatures. I wasn't aware, I say, that my getting shot was common knowledge. I took one in the leg. Some dumb guy thought I was a zombie. I should have known not to be out walking the streets at three in the morning. Goodfellow's a big place. Figured I'd just take a little walk. The voice seems to be smiling again. Some things need to be said to be understood. We know everything. Well, not quite, I say to myself. And smile. If you help us, we can end this problem and start returning to normal. These samples will allow us to do that. Suspicion creeps into my mind. Are you trying to end this or control it? No response. So you are planning on using this immunity of mine for something else. Uh, How does that old saying go? He who is silent is said to agree, something like that? I'm sure you appreciate our position in this, Mr. Stanley. Zombies are overrunning the world. Only in the United States and a very few European countries have we been able to reach a stalemate. We need something to turn the tide. Quite honestly, if we don't get it, we're going to lose. The zombies are becoming more numerous. The only weapons which will kill enough of them would also kill too many of us. That leaves us with face-to-face fighting, and there are just too many of them. You could save all of us. (sighs) I sigh. I notice you still haven't answered my question. And I won't. Decisions like the one you're asking about are not the ones I make. I just do what I am told. (laughs) Like a good little Nazi, huh? Isn't that what they said at Nuremberg? Well, the voice is very upset now. Mr. Stanley, how dare you compare me to a Nazi? I am trying to save lives. Yeah, I spit out. And then you just happen to have the means to make some unstoppable army. Zombies don't feel pain. They don't fear perfect army material. But they also don't use each other. They actually work together. An intake of breath from the voice. (gasps) Are you saying that they are a cooperative force? That they organize? Oops. Almost let a cat out of the bag. Of course not. I'm just saying that that they don't fight against each other. They they don't stab each other in the back. They are more like animals than people. Yes, well, these animals just happen to want to eat us, so we would appreciate your help. She's a little snippy. Just like my ex-wife. Woo! If they think the zombies can be organized, and that I am the one that can do it, I am either dead or... Well... I'm just dead. Zombiedom is looking better all the time. Look, I'm just not keen on giving you the means to take over the world just to save the world from being taken over. Um, well, you know what I mean. Are you saying that you aren't going to cooperate with us? I am saying that I won't be a guinea pig. I am willing to prove my loyalty, but not by letting you dissect me. If you can't use the samples you have, you're just SOL. We could force you to cooperate. You can force me to choose sides, but I don't really want to side with the living dead. Not much of a future there, huh? Now, we help each other. We can both be happy. I don't want to live in a world of zombies, I can tell you that. Well, silence for a moment. Then... If we have to compromise with you, we will. But we will have your help, Mr. Stanley. You owe this to your country. Right. Then, the next morning, I learned that humans smell really good. When the family came downstairs, I found myself almost salivating. 
Take the best food smell you can think of and imagine yourself starving but not being able to eat. It's that good. Or bad, depending on your point of view. I thanked them for their hospitality and asked for directions to Goodfellow. As I walked, I thought some more about zombies. Didn't have much choice. I kept coming up on small groups. They would just look at me, ask, Food? Then go on. I noticed two things. The first one is something we all should have noticed earlier. Zombies never travel in packs of less than three. Ever. If a pack gets diminished, they stop hunting for food and start hunting for other zombies to travel with. They search mentally, sending out some kind of help message. The closest group not eating will come to them, meet them halfway. The new, larger group will then start off looking for food. The second thing I noticed is that they have a very distinctive smell. Animals must be able to pick it up. That's why you don't see many animals getting eaten. At least, not animals free to run. I could smell them a long way off, and apparently they could smell me too. Every time I picked up the scent, I got the food thought, usually long before I actually saw them. Wind definitely affected the range of the smell, but I guess that's normal. When I got to the FSR, they let me in, but only after some serious questions about the bite. Then it almost went south. Inside the FSR was George, or, or Jim, or whatever. He had survived and made it. Probably had told the story of how I had been bitten and had run off to change. He pulled me aside, started threatening to turn me in as a zombie if I didn't tell him the cure I had found. I had been wondering what would happen if I bit someone. Would they become a full zombie? Or just almost like me? I found out. Now. So I think they're going to take me apart to find out what makes me not a zombie. Then use that to make controllable zombies. Or zombie warriors, or whatever. Not this boy. The voice seems a little too eager to find out about me. That's why I ain't gonna tell her that I can talk to the zombies. So, Mr. Stanley, you apparently don't sleep anymore. Is that true? I nod my head. Mr. Stanley? Yes, that's true. Good. No camera. Other than the appetite, the need to constantly move, and not sleeping... Are there any other zombie-like, uh, ish behaviors you've exhibited? Shaking my head, I say, No, that's pretty much it. Except, I add to myself, that I can call for help, too. You see, I think I've found a way out of here. And with that very thought, an alarm starts blaring. What's that? I ask. Um... The voice hesitates. It appears that a rather large force of zombies is attacking the facility. Trying to keep the smile out of my voice, I ask, Are you going to be able to hold them off? We don't know. This isn't a large building, and we don't have many troops. And there are a lot of zombies. Well, for crying out loud, let me out of here! I can fight them better than anybody else. And, and if they eat all you guys up, I'll, I'll starve in here! Let me out! I can help! The voice is quiet for a moment. All right. We'll let you out. Lord knows we need every able body we can get. And close. I ain't fighting zombies in the buff. There is no response. But the bolt throws on the door in a minute or so. The door opens, and a rather attractive woman enters. When she speaks, I recognize her. The voice. Handing me a duffel, she says, Here are your clothes. I'll be waiting outside. When you are dressed, I'll take you to the lieutenant. He'll put you to use. She backed out and closed the door. It didn't lock. Ah, I hear that Jeff is leading the pack. Turns out his name wasn't George, or Jim. He tells me they will take the building soon. I dress quickly, then open the door. There is a soldier standing with her. Uh, uh, ma'am, could I speak to you? Private? Certainly, Mr. Stanley. She enters and closes the door. She smells so good. And the meat is very rare. Author's Note 
Hello, I'm Clay Duggar, and I hope you've enjoyed my story, Sides. Sides came about as I restarted my hobby of writing. The original idea was to have an immune man to be a kind of superhero running through the city, dispatching the poor, shambling undead, all the time trying to avoid being killed by the living. But that's not the tale that wanted to be told. Since I don't actually write my stories, I only proofread the voices in my head, Sides is the story that came out. It's the first of a series of zombie stories exploring the theme of who is the real monster, us or the zombie. All right, uh, I guess it's time for the cast list. I like these cast list things. Uh, me too. I wonder if anybody else does. Probably not. Mm. It's our show. There's not much to like about it. Unless you're actually involved in the making of, right? You're bumming me out here, man. Oh, sorry. Well, let's move on then. Rish Outfield played the part of Carl Stanley in today's story. Mm. Big Anklevich did the voice of two different soldiers. The one who holds a gun at Mr. Stanley's head when he's being unstrapped. And the one who yells, shooter, right before he gets bit. You could just say uh, two soldiers. Two soldiers is plenty? I think so. Okay, two soldiers. An Italian film director is not sufficient. <laughs> and the part of The Voice was played by R.E. Chambliss, who also produced today's story. Excellent. Oh, hey, we would also like to thank all of the people who send in oh, that's right. zombie voices for us. I know that was months ago, <laughs> but the episode was supposed to hit months ago yeah so yeah thanks a lot for that all, all you folks who sent those in that was really cool we had several to work with and that, that was a lot of fun good enough i hope you enjoyed that bit of tail were you just checking to see if i was paying attention were you uh splunge <laughs> splunge for me too okay so uh yeah that is zombie story number two for us yeah you're a big fan of zombies, aren't you? You were a zombie at one time before you were cured, right? Mm. <laughs> or no, you are a zombie today, it turns out. I'm a zombie. I'm 16, and no one <laughs> understands me because I can't speak. Uh, yeah, I, I've, I've loved zombies since my childhood. Those George Romero zombie movies made a big impact on me during that uh, seminal period where my oh, psyche don't talk was... about your seminal period. Well, there is an explicit warning on <laughs> Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan. And it, recently, you and I have been watching the uh, Frank Darabont series, The, the right. Walking Dead, on AMC. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've read a great deal of those comics as well. I had a friend who uh, would just give me the next trade as soon as I finished the one. And good stuff, man. So but, are you a fan of zombies now? I don't know that uh, zombies were ever my thing or, or if I'm a fan of them or not. I really like that feeling that you got in the Walking Dead comics where you, you know, you're never safe. Something could be right behind the next tree, right around the corner. You know, if you wander off even a tiny bit too far, you could be totally screwed. I really enjoy that. But, you know, it doesn't have to be accomplished with zombies. There's other ways that you can get that same kind of a feeling where you're never really safe. But, you know, zombies works out great. It's an interesting uh, device. A trope? Did we decide that we can use that word? We did. We, we, we used that once. What well, didn't Optimus Prime tell us not to say that anymore? He might have. He's told us not to do a lot of things. He's like my friggin' dad anymore. So sick of Optimus Prime. You do have that square, almost robotic jaw. Yeah. So maybe. But uh, yeah, I'm tired of him telling me what to do just because I'm a zombie and I'm 16. <laughs> mm, it's got to be tough. You're just misunderstood, I think. Yeah, misunderstood. Oh, okay. <laughs> you took it too far, man. <laughs> There's a line and you crossed it. Uh, you know, I quite liked this story, despite my feelings, negative feelings toward Clay Duggar. <laughs> I really liked this story the first time I read it. And uh, I think one of our readers liked it so much that she said, I want to be the voice. That's woman's right. Voice. I want to do that. And I, I don't know about you, but when somebody's that enthusiastic about something, I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. 
I couldn't say, you know what, nah. We were thinking maybe an eight-year-old instead, so no, it's not going to work. When somebody was that excited to do it, you just, uh, okay. I'm trying to think of an example of uh, some kind of a movie that had somebody like that. Well, you know, sometimes there will be actors, like famous people, that want to do cameos in a movie, and they'll, they'll do it for nothing, you know, or they'll do it for scale or something. They just so want to work on a certain project, or they uh-huh. want to work with a certain director and all that. And yeah, for the most part, I think you'd be crazy to say no. And every yeah. once in a while, I'm sure there is a director that says, well, no, because everybody's going to be talking about you showing up in that one scene or whatever, and it's going to change the feel of the movie, or you know, it's going to distract uh-huh. I don't yeah, know. I heard about this guy that wanted to be in the Spider-Man movie so bad that he did it for free. What a douche. Why would somebody do that? I have no idea. But he just like showed up there to be an extra for free because he was so into Spider-Man. Wow. I See, I didn't think there was a level lower than extra, but f- unpaid extra. <laughs> I guess that's the, that takes the case. Yeah, for, the for, <laughs> it does take the cake. Yes, yeah, not the case. But yeah, the guy came back again for the the sequels and was part of it again and again. It's crazy. Someone would want to do something so bad. People never learn. Yeah. Bone saw. Bone saw McGraw. (laughs) How is it you remember that? (laughs) The kids were watching it today. That scene was on. I almost IM'd you that when it was on just because of that. I love that. They got the <laughs> bone saw is ready. <laughs> I must have heard that 80 <laughs> times that day. They got the people in the background of the crowd. They got yeah. the saws. They're just bone saw, bone saw, bone saw. Yeah, this is a little aside. We can give it to Wendy or we can leave it in the show. But there's talk that Chris Nolan is going to give Heath Ledger a little cameo in Dark Knight Rises. Did they and shoot something? And well, that's we don't really know, and it might just be BS. But if you've ever been on a film set or you've ever worked on a movie, there's got to be 20, 30, 40 hours of Heath Ledger footage that they could sift through. You know, I mean, true, you could, you could do any number of things because people were saying, Well, are they going to make a computer generated Heath Ledger <laughs> or whatever? You don't have to you do don't that need at the all. End. With just how much work go and how many times each actor are shot from a certain angle and all that stuff, you, you really could. Uh, could do anything you wanted with Ledger in that. Um, now you may have to have somebody dub their voice, but but I don't know. I mean, it might be just on a TV. It might just be... I don't want to know. If the movie could come out tomorrow, and I don't know anything about it or who's who else is going to be in it or what's... You know, it, it would just be great because you're going to it pure and, and right. everything would be a surprise. You could have him in the Arkham Asylum just sitting in there as... Uh... Whistling or smiling. Yeah, or yeah just... He's dealing done, cards and stuff. There's the part where he's already in the, the jail. You know, I'm sure they got lots of shots of that. You could just change the background around for you. I always like how they keep bringing up uh, Scarecrow in the the Batman movies. They had him in there again in the next one, getting uh, captured another time. Yeah, that's something to look forward to when Clay Duggar is 50. <laughs> so what do you think of those uh, Walking Dead TV show. We mentioned a little bit the uh, comics that I read, which are great, and I can't wait as they go through the TV show for them to get to all that stuff. Well, I tried to watch some of it on Halloween night because I believe it premiered that Sunday, the, the Halloween. Yes, it did. Uh, they I, ran it three times in a row that night. Okay. I was able to uh, record like several football games and some other stuff, and then still I was able to get uh, that show on i think the third showing the third time it came around that was handy anyhow you were recording it and i think with the intention of us watching it together so Uh halfway through i turned it off and figured i would catch up with you later and we would we would watch it together but a friend of ours he emailed me the next day and he said oh did you watch walking dead and i told him that i'd watched some of it and he didn't like it at all Hmm. his main complaint was that he had seen it all before and he referenced a couple, you know, that there was a child zombie at the beginning of the Dawn of the Dead remake, and that there was, uh, you know, the beginning of Twenty Eight Days Later with the guy waking up in the hospital, and you know, he just he had like a laundry list of things that this ripped off. Uh-huh. And then the next week, he said, "Well, I watched it again because he was willing to give it another shot for the next episode." And he said that the next episode was better. And so I thought, "Oh, well, that's cool." And when you and I got together, I guess it was last week. We sat down, we watched the pilot, and then we watched the second episode. I think we even watched the third. We watched the, the third. third, too. Yeah, we watched three. And 
I couldn't disagree with him more. The pilot was so much better than the next two episodes, in my opinion. And there's this moment in the pilot where one of the characters has a zombie in the crosshairs of a rifle. And he's trying to will himself to pull the trigger and he can't do it. And I was just like, wow, that's just, I, I don't know. For me, that was like the emotional high of the whole series thus far. There's still more episodes to go. Right. Not a heck of a lot more episodes to go. <laughs> Yeah, that was something I was going to complain about. We watched the first three episodes. At the time, that was last week, I had five episodes of this recorded. And uh, yeah, at the end of the third episode, they're like, only three more episodes left. And I was like, what the hell? This thing just started. Apparently, this is a whole season of this show. Six episodes. That's like a, a barely a mini series. I mean, they do that in like two weeks for a mini series or whatever. And and you're, I think the Battlestar Galactica mini series probably ran as long as this entire season of this show is going to run. That's just you would think they're putting so much like advertising and it, it's such a big deal. That they would trust it enough to go beyond six episodes, but maybe they're just trying to feel it out and see whether people will watch it, whether it's worth it or not to go on to the next season or whatever. I don't know. Maybe that'll be the new thing. TV shows never have full seasons to begin. They just have a six-episode season to see if you like it enough to renew it for another season. I don't know, but... That sure is ridiculous. Is it? I, I hope, at the very least, that it's not going to be like Battlestar Galactica, where it's like, and come back next season in 2014 when we give you another three episodes. <laughs> yeah, you have to tune in fall of 2011 for the next episode. It's <laughs> ridiculous. But after the ratings came out of that very first show, it got renewed for a second season. And I don't understand why they couldn't just say, okay... We'll take a two-month hiatus in December and January yeah. and then start up again in February and we'll have new episodes then. Instead, they're like, well, we'll, we'll, wait, we'll wait eight months and then do it again. Yeah, by that time, people have completely forgotten the thing even exists that is likely to be the death knell for this thing instead of, you know, okay, now we're really going to get started kind of a thing. Didn't they do that with Glee too? Didn't Glee just have like one episode? I think Glee had an episode after the Super Bowl, and then they didn't have another one until September or something like that. Yeah, that's a long time in between. But I guess Glee caught on, so maybe they'll just do that kind of crap all the time. Who knows? I, I don't really understand the, the – the, is timidity a word? I think it might but be. But it seems to be what AMC or the producers or investors or whoever is at fault is feeling – um, it's just like, yeah, we are worried that it won't maybe be worth worried. it to make more. But Maybe they're worried that it'd be too violent or, and people just wouldn't go for it. I mean, it, it does have an awful lot of blood and gore and dead people in it like crazy. It's, God, it's amazing. It's all the dead people. It is really graphic, which I found surprising in a good way because uh -huh. there was a lot of talk in the summer that, well... It's not on Showtime. It's not on HBO. It's not on one of those pay cable channels. Right. So it's not like they're going to be able to go all out like the comic book. I mean, holy cow. The comic book is so unbelievably graphic. Yes, it's very, uh, very violent. Every time you think they're not going to go there, they do. They go there and then some. So people were thinking, oh, they're really going to pull their punches. But I didn't feel like they were pulling their punches. You know, there's a couple words they didn't use, which tend to get used a lot on movies and stuff. But... They said jag off instead. What's wrong with jag off though? They see that <laughs> they said jack wagon. Oh wait, no, that was that stupid commercial. Sorry, that was something else. You jack wagon. <laughs> you know what's worse is after I heard that commercial, the whole time I was on that trip, I just kept calling people jack wagons. <laughs> Hello. Hello. You know, I think we may need to pause this and buy new microphones right now. <laughs> No offense, but my sign language is terrible. So I, yes, George Romero basically created the zombie as we know it in 1968 and Night of the Living Dead. And, and, and in his view, this was a monster where you could see yourself in it and we could see the ills of society in it. And, and if you watch that first movie, there's a lot of stuff that sort of feels timely about race the good old boys going out there and having fun and lynching and stuff like that. And then, you know, when he did Dawn of the Dead in 78, 
there was a lot about consumerism and a lot about people going out and, and spending more money than they had and, and, and needing to be in the mall and all that, even though it was, you know, it, it was not good for them. And then with Day of the Dead, it was the military. The military is bad, the military calling the shots and, and, and things like that. And so for me, you know, I sort of think of zombies as a, a way to make a point, to make some kind of political statement or, 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 or just some statement greater than just the boogeyman is at the door. And uh -huh. I think Clay was doing something in this uh, where at some point, and I don't know when it happens, there's a shift of seeing these zombies as monsters to where suddenly you're seeing the human beings as monsters. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been done before, but it's a really cool way to take a look at ourselves, to take something that used to be us and isn't us anymore, or put us in a society where we devolve and become more like animals or, or whatever it is. What do people do when you know society crumbles around them? Do they stand tall or do they allow themselves to be morally compromised or, or allow themselves to crumble as well? We talked about that. I don't know if it was in the episode, but that after the We Got Back the Lights episode, and just it's hard to say. Well, what would you do in right. the situation? And in reality, kind of like when your wife burst through the front door you know, to murder your children or whatever – where you're just like, wow, I didn't realize that I would attack an intruder coming into the house. <laughs> you didn't know that until right. it happened. That's something that I've always found interesting as a writer myself is putting myself or extensions of me, me with breasts, in a situation and saying, how would I respond? Or and Saying just how creepy would you with breasts be? <laughs> Don't go there. <laughs> you look like Marilyn Manson with those man boob things that he used to go around in. I'm on my way, folks. Except for he had no nipples, if I remember right. It was more creepy for some reason. The bat suit had nipples. Don't you dare go there. And that was yet more creepy. When we... We talked last time about zombies, and I believe that was after the chemo episode, which included zombies that we did at Halloween time. That was the condemned episode? Yeah. It, at that time, we had this episode already in the shoot, getting ready to launch. So we knew we had already two zombie episodes. Now that we've made it here... In the shoot, getting ready to launch, we now have a third zombie story. This is becoming a zombie podcast. But all three are different kinds of zombies. Yeah, that's, I think, the interesting thing. These are your Romero-type zombies that are, you know, undead. They're dead people that have now reanimated and are wanting to eat brains. Then the condemned were actually not dead. They were infected infected with some crazy rabies that make them seem like they're dead rage infested monkeys rage infested monkeys bit them yes and now the upcoming zombie story is yet another type of zombie which i think is probably the original type zombies when they first started were kind of like a voodoo kind of a thing right where like witch doctor something or other reanimates the corpse to make it go and do its bidding or something like that. Right. That's what before Romero came along and... Yeah, the black magic zombie, yeah. Which has almost completely gone away. Yeah. You know, the only thing that I can think of having ever... And I didn't actually see this movie, but... Serpent in the Rainbow. Yes. That's the only thing that I think I can think of ever being a black magic voodoo zombie thing is the Serpent in the Rainbow. Can you think of anything else that was the voodoo zombie? V-O-O-D-O-O. -O -O. Wait. That's right. How it does is he, two O's, two no, 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 no. How, how does he do it in the something economics? The in the does he like spell? How does it's he? Do, Ferris Bueller. Yes. How does he do that line? And then finally goes the voodoo economics. Sorry, we'll just cut that part out. <laughs> oh wait, Ot, you really are a mean little cuss, aren't you? You know, I don't know why that has gone away. Uh, but certainly the. Romero type zombie are easier to do. You don't have to explain where they came from. Right. You don't have to have so just some kind of a contagion. I, you know, it's it's possible that they don't want the, to uh. raise the question of race. You know, with having Haitian bad guys or or island bad guys or Creole or or any of that stuff. I, uh huh. I, I don't know, but the, it's strange that you don't get a lot of the. There was this flick called The Skeleton Key that Aaron Kruger wrote that had. <laughs> Kate Hudson in it. And it's probably the only Kate Hudson movie besides Almost Famous I Can Stomach. And it had a lot of that old Narlins 
voodoo. I got friends on the other side. Yes. Oh, hey, there you go. See you guys later. I'm going for a smoke break. Uh, oh, you know, there's one other little little thing about this story. It's a cautionary tale, if you will. You, you know, it was like the week before Halloween, and you and I had oh. made a, a schedule <laughs> of the stories that we were going to produce in October. And I believe there were four of them with a fifth possibility. If I was able to write that vampire story and get it recorded and all that done in time, then we would have five. Mm -hmm. But it took so long to get that first one done that it was like the... 11th of, of October or something like that. And it right. became clear that we wouldn't have time for yeah. even three, let alone five in October. Um, and so like the week before Halloween, I emailed Clay <laughs> and I told, why do you laugh? Because uh, I know the story. That's why it makes me chuckle. <laughs> uh, okay. Well then I'll, I'll tell it for those that don't already know it. Well, yeah, I figured that we were making the show for the uh, people listening and not so much for me. Okay. That's a new way of looking at it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I sent Clay an email just to let him know we, we really had intended to be able to get it in, but we just didn't have enough time, so we're going to have to bump it. Um, and, and I'm sorry, but you know, I know that you were excited about hearing it, but you know, we're going to do these Broken Mirror stories, and then we'll make sure it's like the first one after that. So you know, ho hopefully you know, around Thanksgiving, December, we'll get your story on. I'm really sorry, but I just figured I'd let you know because, you know, you've been waiting so long. So I sent that off to him, and, and I think I may have mentioned it to you, and you're like, why Why would you even – why do you <laughs> talk to people? Why do you apologize to people? I try uh, to keep them away from people because – Every time, it just causes more problems than it solves. Anytime Rish interacts with other people, it's just – it's it's not pretty. So what happened here was I guess he was at work and he received my email on his – Device. His portable email reader, his – Crackberry. His droidberry. His, his crackberry? <laughs> Somebody I know that calls him that all the time. So he read it. But he only read the part that said, hey, I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to get to your story. We ran out of time. Uh, that's all that he was able to read on his, his <laughs> minuscule screen. He, he saw that and got so angry and never thought to scroll down. I don't know how exactly that worked out. but Well, yes, he began to expand and his clothes started to tear. His skin turned green. <laughs> he was overcome with righteous indignation and... I guess he came within a, a curly hair's breadth of telling me what I could do with my podcast. He used it as a suppository, <laughs> apparently. But, you know, he calmed himself down because people were wondering why his face had turned red and he was perspiring and gasping. And they just thought he had to poop really bad and it wouldn't come out. But it turns out it was Rish's fault. This is too much. He crapped out <laughs> an, uh, an entire walnut. It was just... <laughs> Unchewed. You guys were nominated for a Parsec Award. Uh, so I guess he tried to calm himself down, and eventually he couldn't. He was just – he was so upset that he'd been used and mistreated and worked over and, and basically mocked by some heathen like me. And so he called his wife, and he just had to vent to her and let her know, hey, this is what those buttholes did to me. <laughs> and she's like, oh, oh, you know, I'm so sorry. And she read the email, and she said, well, Clay – I don't understand why you're so angry. I mean, he did apologize. And, you know, it's just, just a little bit of time. And he's like, what are you talking about? And she's like, well, what, what about when he says, you know, he'll try and get it on in November or December? And to his horror, he hadn't read any of the rest of the email. I guess he hadn't been able to. Or, or like you said, he wasn't able – he didn't scroll down. He was already uh, turning red by the time he read the first sentence. So it's too late. So – he felt like he owed me an apology, even though he hadn't sent me this hateful Mr. Hat, you go to hell and you die email. He stopped himself. and But then he had to apologize because he had felt the, uh, the, <laughs> the, the, the impulse to send this email. And he told me the whole situation. And, and I told you and we both I had a chuckle. And then I said, well, that serves you right for apologizing in the first place. You idiot. Yep. Somehow. You must never apologize. I'm the a-hole. Yeah, as usual. <laughs> and, you know, that's something that I need to get over, I guess. I, I Clay sent this story to us probably in, like, May. Or earlier. Or earlier? Wow. <laughs> I don't know. It's possible. We, a part of it was we wanted to save it for Halloween. Yeah. And, the, and we had already done one zombie story in October. 
And so we figured, okay, if we're going to bump any story, it's going to be the other zombie story. Yeah. So it's not like back-to-back -back zombie stories. We don't want it to be one of those podcasts that just does the same thing week after week. Um, didn't you read Lord of the Rings in high school? <laughs> so we've got this and another horror story. Both of them were sort of tentatively planned for October. And, and who knows? We may have already gotten that one out of the way. But – the show is always more difficult than we imagine it'll be. It is. It's funny how hard those Broken Mirror episodes turned out being. This one was fairly easy because there were almost no characters. Yeah. Um, but then, of course, we still shunted it off for Renee to do. Uh, but like the, 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 the middle Broken Mirror story, the really, really long one. Uh-huh. You know, Dax one Plays Fairy. Dax Plays Fairy, right. Da <laughs> there are so many characters on that. And you, you assign somebody to do the character and, the, and then you read it. And three weeks later, you're editing it and you realize that they missed a line. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, geez. Okay, so you send an email and have to wait for them to record it and get it back to you before you can continue on – past that point and it just and it's uh, not like they missed a line it's i missed a line when highlighting the lines for them so they, i'm sh they always read everything i ask them to but yeah it's just amazing how slow things can go sometimes that's why i have really been trying to make a push to get others to help us like renee did with this story to help us as producers because the more of a team we have working on these kind of things the more often our, our show can come out. So I'm hoping that this is more of that working out. Sometimes when the microphone is off, you and I talk about Escape Pod or we talk about Drabblecast or we talk about Starship Sofa. And I have no idea how they manage to be a weekly podcast. Me neither. Um, now, granted, all the other podcasts except for Starship Sofa are shorter than us. Right. But still, do you think Norm has like 15 stories that he's accepted and already recorded that are just in the line waiting and, and they go through a conveyor belt of, <laughs> you know, and the music gets put on it and say other voices and then the intro comes and I, I have no idea how, how these things are done. <laughs> yeah, me neither. I'll bet there's a podcasting for dummies book out there. There is, as a matter of fact, written by T. Morris and hold on, Evo Terra. Okay. Are you impressed? T. Morris actually did a podcast to go along with the T Podcasting for Dummies uh, book. Unfortunately, we'd already been doing our podcast for like a year before I ever knew it existed. Oh, okay. So by the time I listened to it, I'd learned all those things the hard way already. I don't know why I mentioned that. Oh, just when we started ours, I guess we were just learning. We were making it up as we went along. Yeah. And somebody recently said, I think it was Liz said that we were getting better all the time. And I, I didn't know if I believed her or not. <laughs> I thought about it and I just thought, really? Are we actually getting better? Because I don't really go back and listen to old episodes. Right. But I just can't imagine that we would have eclipsed like Good Day by Saul Lemonrod or Uberman or some of those things that we did in our first year. Maybe you've got more sound effects more music, more yeah, things like that. but Those things definitely came along over time, that's for sure. Once we reached a certain point, I think we reached just the level that we thought was good, and we've kind of stuck pretty much at that level. I don't know. And that's something we've talked about both on the air and off, too, is just how far is too far? How, how much is good enough? And that's, that's something that I think we're still trying to discover. Yeah, I think it's... Uh, Story by story basis, as far as that goes, you can do less on one story and more on another, and it'll work both ways. Because I often don't hear the episode until it's done. I don't hear the story part of the episode until it's done, and I'll listen to your edit with the music and the sound effects and the other voices. And it's not that I'm critical, but I'll notice things where I'm like, oh, I would have done this or I would have fixed that. Or it's like, oh, shoot, we didn't have a, a horn when he, he said, you know, you could hear traffic outside the window and all that stuff. And that sort of, what do you call that? Monday morning quarterbacking? No, that sort of second guessing can just drive you insane. <laughs> because, you know, it, it can never be perfect. It can never have everything unless that's what your job is and that's what you're doing every day and you're willing to put in seven hours just on the sound effects. And Renee, she edited the first Broken Mirror story right. for us 
And I think she kind of had that question of, okay, well, how much do I have to put in here? How many sound effects? How much music? How much does the music have to be part of the story? And I didn't know what to tell her. <laughs> I, I think I just told her, put in whatever you want. And if Big feels like he needs a little bit more, he'll throw in more. If, if you just want to do voices and send it our way and have us do the sound effects, do that too. Because I would hate for somebody to get one of these stories and be like, oh no, I've already spent nine hours doing it and it's still not up to par or you know, where, <laughs> where it feels like it. You know, it'll never be. I don't think that's possible. It, like sometimes we'll work with voice actors, we'll work with kids or whatever, and they're not professional actors. <laughs> that's they're for not sure. being paid. They don't have to be there. And once you get to the point where the kid's like, oh, I don't want to do it again. Okay, well, do I become the bad guy and make them do it again? Or you just let it go? And that's something that I've hated having Depends to Depends on with. who it is, I suppose. Don't do it if I say so. <laughs> you can do that with some, but... Uh... Yeah. You know, there's a lot of different things that we've thought about trying out. We've tossed around the idea of getting together with all the actors that would be involved in the story at once on a Skype call and doing it as though it were live. But, you know, if we wanted something different, we'd say, oh, no, 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 no say it this way or something. But we may still try that at some point. We're still uh, considering it. The, the problem is that we're just all over the globe. Yeah, that is the problem. Definitely. And it might be three o'clock in the morning in Sydney when we're trying to record at right. two o'clock in the afternoon here. And, you know, people have jobs and, and all that stuff. That certainly would be fun if we could manage to do that. And, you know, I, I know like sometimes people at conventions will sit around and they'll record and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah just, I've heard a couple of live, I, I think Drabblecast did a live episode once from Dragon Con or something yeah. like that. Didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And so, yeah, who knows? If you'd like to help us out on the show in some capacity, please let us know. Just editor at doonsteef.com. And Clay himself has started podcasting. He's You heard him in the author's note. He's got a good voice. Yeah. Um, over at, shoot, what's the, uh, what's the subcast of the Drabblecast called? Dribblecast. Right. Over there, I guess they've been doing a bunch of hundred word stories and anybody that wants to record them, just, you know, cut their teeth to find uh -huh. these. And, and you can go as far as you want, as far as music and sound effects and on those too. And I know he's done, well, last time I looked, he had done like 10 of those. Cool. And it's just a he's, good way to learn. He, he also put together that episode for us that aired just a little while ago, uh, Invisible Kingdom. Right, right. He edited that or he Yeah, produced he produced it that and uh yeah i i thought that turned out pretty well uh, for a uh you know doing a hundred word drabble versus doing a several thousand word story is is kind of a different kind of an endeavor and so you know his first chance at doing a big long story i thought it came out really well and we are expecting, expecting him to do more your papers you know we were talking just a second ago about Renee being the uh, producer of this episode. Did we mention her hot voice? Uh, if we didn't, we should have. Oh, okay. And as far as that goes, Renee has been moonlighting. Some walk by night, oh, uh, some fly by day. Maybe not, nothing oh, could no change. No more singing, please. Okay, all right, go ahead. <laughs> Say it and sure of the way. I gave you an opening to interrupt me and you didn't, so... There that. is a sun. It's like a kind of torture moon. to have to hear the show. Okay. <laughs> She's been unfaithful. What? Wait, that's probably not right either, is it? <laughs> At least it didn't introduce a bout of singing. Right, She's it been... <laughs> shut me up. <laughs> She's been taking that hot voice of hers to another podcast. It, it was inevitable. Once a woman becomes involved with me, uh, the, the end is... Nine. And is near. Yeah, she she actually uh, sent me an email about it just the other day and, and was hoping that we would run the promo for this site. It's a website called newfictionwriters.com. I'm sorry. For a second there, it's like nude fiction writers? <laughs> well, I am there. Well, you ought to go to one of those cons where all the fiction writers show up. Oh, and I then, have. So. And then maybe you might change your uh, it's tune. It's a supermodel convention <laughs> compared to a Star Trek one, my friend. <laughs> anyway, I was actually attractive at the Star Trek convention I went to. There's very few places where I can feel that way. But uh, anyways, yeah, um, this website, it's like a 
community of writers that get together and they share their work. Oh, yeah. It's kind of like the 5225 workshop that we talked about, the, the Facebook group where you're trying to write 25 stories in 52 weeks. This is a similar thing where writers can get together and they can share their stories on the site. And uh, the guy who runs this site, Tony Whitford, will choose some stories and he will do podcasts of them so there's a podcast that goes along with this website and uh, renee has read some of the stories for this podcast you know that's like a bonus you get to hear her amazingly hot voice that many more times she's got a promo for the the site so uh, oh wait ot you want to just play that promo for us Irish outfield. Oh, come on man <laughs> i hadn't even said anything you sang the theme to Hawaii. That is enough to ruin anyone's day. Yeah, that was enough. <laughs> wow, he hadn't spoken up in so long. I, I think that's why we were actually getting episodes done. All right, play the uh, promo. Pro hey, everybody, this is R.E. Chambliss. I would like to take a few seconds to tell you about a great new website and podcast, newfictionwriters.com. The New Fiction Writers Podcast features some of today's best new writers, as well as classic short stories. If you're a writer or a fan of short stories, like me, I invite you to join the community of writers and fans of short fiction at newfictionwriters.com. Sign up, create an account, and share your imagination with us. Interact with the writers, leave comments, and let us know what you think. You can even submit a story for the podcast. Just go to newfictionwriters.com for all the details. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast and find newfictionwriters.com on Facebook and on Twitter. Thanks for listening, and I hope to see you there. So there you have it. Swing over to uh, newfictionwriters.com. You know, maybe I will go join their community. You know, you and I, we talk about finding motivation to write. And, and life motivates me to write. I write all the time. And when I'm not writing, I'm thinking about sexual intercourse. When I'm not writing, I'm thinking about stories. I'm thinking about writing. Boy, mm -hmm. Freudian thing. <laughs> what I need is motivation to share my work, to submit my work, to you know, right. send that out to somebody that can publish it or, or tell me that it needs work or, or all that stuff. It just goes into cyberspace or onto my hard drive and no one ever sees it. So maybe I should join this community and share one of my stories on there and see if people... It sounds like a good idea. Good. They can give you some feedback on it or encouragement for it so you can uh, take it where it needs to go. I think you should do the same. Uh, now, you don't have the same stumbling block that I do with sharing your work. Yet another reason I should resent you, but I don't. But, you know, maybe we should both join together. You know, it's like, hey, would you like to join a cult with me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a good idea. We ought to give it a shot. Yeah, you know, listeners, all three of you can uh, also head over there and take a look at it. But, yeah, thanks, Renee, for letting us know about that. And thanks a lot, Renee, for producing the story for us this week. So it's really cool because uh, the whole producing thing has really been picking up recently to the point where yes, we yes, have I'm sorry in the six months since renee started work on this episode <laughs> the whole face of dune steve has changed yeah it really has my skin has cleared up and i oh and mine has gotten much more zitty no uh we we've got this file that we go to each week as we get together and uh start recording stuff and we look at what we need to work on and the file is basically a list of all the stories that we've accepted and I made up a little code for myself to figure out how we know where the file is at. So if a story has been recorded, I put it in bold, been assigned out to a producer, I'll put it in italics. Story has already been edited and returned to us, I'll underline it. Up until maybe three months ago, the entire list was pretty much not bold, not italics, not underlined. It was all just standard, regular old text. And suddenly all of that has changed. Almost the entire list is bold. And it's all in italics. And some of them are even underlined already and returned back to us. It's just amazing. Uh, we may actually succeed in being a weekly show here pretty soon. Right, we're doing the, the Lost Episode trilogy. And you've got days when each episode is supposed to drop. 
And it looks like we're actually going to make those deadlines. Yeah. We, that never happens. <laughs> we actually went through and assigned weekly dates to every story. It's just, it's just really cool. So, you know, I don't know if we say this enough or not, but we need to say thanks to all our producers, I think, every week. So thanks, Renee, for producing our story this week. And thanks to the others that are out there toiling now and we'll be thanking them in their episode for producing uh, the story that is airing. And you know, on top of that, I think there's somebody else that we need to thank and she doesn't get enough thanks. I think Phoebe she... Cates for that scene in Fast Times. That's right. Yeah, I want to stand up. A, p- a part of me wants to stand up and thank her. Oh, that's you're shaking. Your, that's not what you're talking about. Uh, no, yeah, we were actually going somewhere else with that. But you know, I can understand your feelings there. All right. So way to go. Actually, I was wanting to thank Sudden Death Nicole for all the work that she does for us. I wanted to thank Sudden Death Nicole. Dang okay, it. Go Why ahead. do you always do that? Oh, no, no. You've already started. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I see. We wanted to say thanks to the tireless work she does, to Nicole and also all the slush readers. We have probably like 10 different people that are reading the slush in our slush pile for us these days and every week or so we get a new story that nicole says okay this one has gone through the uh, gauntlet it's made it this far check it out and tell us is this one that you would like yeah how long has it been since you read one of those stories where it just ends halfway through and he's like uh the end i guess <laughs> Thanks for wasting your time reading this. (laughs) Yeah, you know, it's amazing how much uh, we can get accomplished when we don't have to do that kind of stuff. We don't fall months and months behind. We don't have to close our submissions because we're so far behind on the list of stories that need to be read. You know, all that stuff is is kind of gone away. We'll have to ask her sometime what the turnaround time for, not turnaround, but, uh, you know, response time. Uh Uh-huh for that is i recently well i don't want to tell you this but budget i'll I'll tell you i recently submitted my work to somebody and they said they had a two-week response window yeah and i just thought how (laughs) i mean unless you get one submission every two weeks how could you possibly have a two-week window but we'll see how that goes and how long it takes them to reject my work (laughs) they must have an army of oompa loompas that just read through all those things (laughs) we'd like to thank our oompa loompas (laughs) that's right oompa dee do folks (laughs) thank you so much for dealing with the orange face and the green hair. I know it's uncomfortable. And those overalls and... And the scary tunnel. And the shoes with the curly <laughs> things on the end, you know. I, I'm sure that's got to be embarrassing when you go to work. But uh, thanks for doing that for us. <laughs> uh, if somebody would like to be a slush reader, which basically means that Sudden Death Nicole would send you some of the story submissions that have been sent to us... And you get to give them thumbs up, thumbs down. I think uh, you get to give them a score from 1 to 10. Right. And uh, if you'd like to join that illustrious crew, please send us an email at editor at doonstief.com and uh, just mention that and we will s- we will sign you up. That's right. Welcome aboard. I think everybody should do it at least once. Wait, what? Be an Oompa Loompa, you know. Ah. Uh, So, because of all the help, it looks like we'll be back again next week. That's right. Weird. The big and rich that recorded this episode that hadn't seen The Walking Dead, that were looking forward to Thanksgiving, they had no idea (laughs) that we would become a weekly show in 2011. Crazy. I guess I'll never know. (laughs) So, yeah. I hope you uh, all liked the story. Yeah, you know what? Let's finish this and we'll watch the last... 40 minutes of the the (laughs) Walking Dead miniseries. (laughs) Now, if you were the producer of this Walking Dead series, would you end it on like a final note of this is the end? You know, with the off chance in the back of your mind of what if we don't get renewed and all that this is all we'd have. Do you close the circle or do you end it on a cliffhanger saying, okay, people are going to be salivating for more episodes. There's no way we won't get renewed after this ending. They should end it on a cliffhanger. I guess they had all six in the can, you think, already done before the uh, first one ever aired. Yes. So they wouldn't know that they were being renewed, but it's something that they expected to go on for a lot longer than six episodes. 
I think you told me once that the idea behind the comic book was that it's, you know, a zombie movie that doesn't end. And uh, with an idea like that, you can't just try and tie it all up after six episodes. So I sure hope they did that because that's what it always was in the comic books. It's just one thing after another, you know, it just got worse and worse. So uh, I look forward to seeing a lot of that stuff. And it was interesting how many things they've added to the whole story. I mean, the comic book was pretty dense. It had a lot of stuff going on, and yet they've still added a whole lot of extra crap in there to pad it out, I guess. I don't know. Well, my opinion was that the comic book was basically the story of Rick Grimes. He was the main character, and then there's a bunch of peripheral characters. Right. But the show is much more of an ensemble so they have to invent things for all these other characters to do to justify paying them to be in it every single week. And, and who knows? It may not be like that at all, but certainly the, the show True Blood is like that, where right. there's a bunch of characters. It's based on a book, and in the book, you know, a character may be mentioned or he may stop in the bar, and that's it for the whole book. But they have to come up with business to get them every single week in every episode. So it's more of an ensemble. I, I'm not really sure why they do it, but it seems to really work. Well, that's good. And also, in a show like this, you start out with a giant palette of characters so that you can knock off a couple in every other episode. And they will. <laughs> <laughs> as long as they stick to the comic book, even in the slightest, they will. Well, cool. We'll let you all go so we can go and watch some Walking Dead shows, and uh, we'll see you again next time. Hey, thanks, Clay, for being so patient about the production of your story. That's right. And for sending it in in the first place. Yeah, thanks a lot, and uh, we'll see you all later, folks. Good night. See ya. That brings us to the end of the show. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. If you enjoyed today's episode of the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine, please drop by iTunes and give us a five-star rating. We'd be eternally grateful you did. I sure love that Josh Groban, personally. Take two. He's also in a process. Maybe we've already aired the episode of one that he's editing for us, for that matter. Wait, what was that? Invisible Kingdom. Oh, see, I didn't... You think that that will actually air before this? It's possible. It all depends. But we haven't done an Invisible Kingdom episode. That's true. So it's less likely, but you never know. Hmm. All right. You ready? Down with the sound so sweet, y'all. Y'all. We talked last time about zombies, and I believe that was after the chemo episode, which included zombies that we did at Halloween time. Um, right, what was that called? It started with a U. Now you made me forget. I could have said it. It was the word they used for zombies. Yeah. The condemned. A lot of U's in there. Yes. There is no I in team. Do you think chemo stands for something? <sighs> it's got to. It's all caps. It stands for... Self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. I really like that. That's my second favorite. It's an anagram. I think so. I think that's what they're called. You know what my favorite anagram is? Go. MODOK. <laughs> Mechanical organism designed only for killing. <laughs> you got to admit that's pretty cool. <laughs> All right. You ready? Sides. Go. Do you want to say Sides by Clay Duggar? No. Now. You're reading the story. Okay, but I want you to participate in some way. I'll participate in some way, I'm sure. You say Sides by Clay Duggar and I'll say no. Never. Really? Yes. Why? Because you're reading the story. You're going to say the title. I, I can. I don't have a problem with it. I just don't want you to be like I that. will participate. I swear it. The voice seems to be coming from that grill. Check out my grills. Yo's. Another military type comes into view and yanks on the straps around my right wrist, then leaves, without saying any dialogue. Told you I'd get to participate. See, I just got my line in. I'm good. Wish you were good. You know, what really pisses me off is that... You added you know in there. Yes. <laughs> is that this is, was, a 
It was? It was, yeah, I think. You know. No, I don't. I just like saying, you know, this is a storyteller thing. Uh, have you produced yet? Not really, no. Besides three been doing evil children. <laughs> some learning is all. Come on, produce something, man. Produce something other than waste. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm so good at that. We chewed through the zombies. Oh no, they're gonna get infected doing that. We just wanted them to know what being eaten felt like. Am I supposed to have a Texas accent? Who cares? Thanks. So there I lay in the middle of the Nevada desert. <laughs> I'm afraid that we are going to require, well, other samples from you. Well, this day just keeps getting better, doesn't it? Please be in the cup, sir. Jizz in this. What? Wait, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> Should we make some howls and growls? Okay. <laughs> Hey, so sister, where'd you and me, mister, on the radio? Oh, my. They did. Uh, the <laughs> All right. They didn't make it to the house. Could you hear the smile? <laughs> I think so. I guess traveling with zombies while being covered in black zombie blood isn't the best way to win friends and influence people. Or make people. Did I fudge it again? No, you did it right. Should I do it again? No, you're fine. The best way to make people is actually when, when a man and a woman love each other very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they go to uh, a sleazy hotel, usually one that pays, you can pay the bill by the hour. They sign in under a false name. That's probably right. Probably Steve. <laughs> and so it's been one of my favorites, the whole probably Steve thing. <clears throat> the zombies never lie. Sorry. You're fine. Go ahead. Should I, I do that line over? For some reason, I was thinking I was supposed to say the zombies, but that's still you. Okay. That's why I started talking and ruined your take. I feel bad that you get no lines. I'm fine. I'm not an egomaniac that must be the most important person in every story, unlike someone in this room, and I'm not talking announcer man. You're mocking me, aren't you? No, no, he was, he was talking about R-O-8-O-T. Uh, someone has programmed the ability of a douche into the robot. He got the proportionate powers of a douche. The proportionate strength. There's only one douche in this room. But we all know who it is, and I'm not talking about an Ouser man. <laughs> anyway. We've investigated you thoroughly, Mr. Stanley. I thought my ass felt funny. What? I'm sure you appreciate our position in this, Mr. Stanley. Zombies are overrunning the world. Only in the United States and a very few European countries have we been able to reach a stalemate. Hey, well, what about Guam? Guam is a United States territory, so yes. Okay. We need something to turn the tide. Quite honestly, if we don't get it, we're going to lose. How, how about Australia? Australia is, well, they're barely civilized, so I don't know. Uh, we haven't been getting answers to our calls and our text messages. You know, they're, they're just too cool for that, I guess. They, they, they're in the outback. And, you know, they're going for walkabouts, and they already go for walkabouts okay. before they became Okay, I, I don't know anybody in Australia. Oh. I was just asking, well, what about France? France? They already smelled like they were dead before the zombie outbreak. Oops, almost let the cat out. A cat? Oops, almost let a cat out of the bag, which would upset Abby Hilton quite a bit. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't want that cat in the bag at all. That's... Oh, no, no, we wouldn't want to release the cat into the dumpster. Oh, right, we right would. Sorry. The cat is much better off we in the bag. Keep it in the bag with the rocks and, oh, that did I just, I shouldn't have said, wasn't oh, that the point we were trying to I make? Going? There's no chance that Texans would pronounce that in a effed up way, is there? You might say good fella, <laughs> but who cares? F them. Yes. They're only 90% of our listening audience. <laughs> See, there's some, uh... Some really, some real talent, storytelling talent in doing that. You know, uh, act out. 
Yeah. It's commercial break. Cliffhanger chapter. I hate that on that stinking uh, uh, Hunger Games stuff that I'm reading right now because they do that at the end of every chapter and I just got to keep going and I'm up all night. Give me a break. Just one chapter ends other than the last chapter. (laughs) She enters and closes the door. She smells so good. And the meat is very rare. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Start making the running zombie noise. Sound more like you're hungry, you're going after me. What? I just sound like a little girl growling. A girl zombie. Little girl zombie. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hold on just a sec. Um, okay. I'm going to read you what the story says. It says, by this time, the point was moot. She was on me. Jumped right at my face. So make like it sound like you're rah, right at his face. Good. Um, I threw my right arm up and she chomped down. Can you pretend like you're biting your Okay, I think that'll be good. Let me check it out. Alright, so what the story says is, The bullet went right through and into the chest of the second zombie in line. She flew back and didn't get up. So make a sound like, a zombie sound like if you just got hit in the chest. <laughs> Stop. It is her turn. You had your turn. Okay. I'll redo that. Why don't you do it again? Everybody else needs to quiet on the set. Okay, go ahead. (coughs) What about food? We'll do the food part in just a sec. Contrary to popular belief, you can take a zombie down without a headshot. It's just more difficult. Her spine must have been severed because she twitched for a couple of seconds. Why don't you make a twitching sound? And then lay still. I heard her die. In my head, I heard her die. <laughs> Let's do it a little like a... Uh, but it's so much fun to I go... Like a trail off because <laughs> she's dying. Okay. Okay, she can do it. Let's let her do it. <laughs> nice. Okay. Yeah, I know. Well, I'll do... <laughs> I'm amazing at this. We're all, we'll all do the food part. So let me find where it says. I want to read the book, though. You can, but just a sec. Let me find. Food? Food? Okay. Okay, so they would all just look at me and ask, food? So we'll just all get around and say, kind of like zombies. Ready? One, two, three. Food? Okay, let's do it one more time. Food? And it had a lot of that old Narlins voodoo. Thanks. I got friends on the other side. Yes. Oh, hey, there you go. Dude, <laughs> the hell, man? I like Come on. Princess and the Frog so much I farted. <laughs> nice. And she read the email and she said, well, Clay, I don't understand why you're so angry. I mean, he did apologize. And, you know, it's just, just a little bit of time. And he's just like, I don't, what are you talking about? They raped me. Look, <laughs> look at this. They branded me. I'm sorry. I, I have no idea what he actually said to her. He felt like he owed me an apology, even though he hadn't sent me this hateful email of, you know, when you burn in hell, <laughs> I'm going to be standing there with an erection. Oh, yeah. Oh, my. Wow. Sorry. <laughs> Stay. Good boy. Good boy.